Hello, welcome to BEH 221 Resolution Based Counseling. Today we're going to be talking about crisis counseling and assessing suicide potential. <clears throat> Virtually everyone who works in behavioral health will at some point become involved in an immediate crisis. It may be as a counselor dealing with the aftermath of a natural disaster, a suicide hotline, or a volunteer working with survivors of a crime. At another level, you are encounter individuals and family members who have just had a heart attack, learned that they have cancer, or discover that they cannot become pregnant. War, rape, divorce, abuse, gay bashing, witnessing a street shooting, and an endless array of incredibly difficult issues may need to be addressed. And for many people, the client comes to the counselor for the first time after a crisis or during a crisis. So this has a particular resonance uh, for those of you who are going to be working in this field. Crisis counseling is the most pragmatic and action-oriented form of helping. The word pragmatism comes from the Greek word for deed, act, to practice, and to achieve, pragma. Even after, even more than decisional counseling, crisis counseling is concerned with action and useful practical results for the client. Both are provided with a caring attitude and with respect for client response. It has been pointed out that virtually all the world's population experiences one or more crises or traumas in their lifetime. In that sense, crisis is a normal life event, normalizing. The crisis is one foundational idea to keep in mind. Crisis is closely related to the word trauma. So when we use the word trauma, we're also using the concept of what a crisis is. So think of those words in this context as interchangeable. And the reality is that very few people can get through their life without having some sort of crisis, whether it's the death of a loved one, the chronic illness of a loved one, some other life-altering event, we all experience these things, no matter how hard we try not to. So, immediate here and now crises demanding rapid practical action include natural disasters such as flood, fire, and earthquake. And you may live in an area where you haven't had any of those, but keep in mind, yet. It is just a matter of the wrong thing happening at the wrong time and your house could be on fire. Um, you know, rain we see as an impediment to our summer plans, but it can also cause massive flooding. Crime victims, including rape, a school or community shooting, personal assault, including abuse, and being held hostage. Again, these things we see them on the news every day and when we see them we feel so bad for those folks but it could just as easily be one of us the aftermath of a serious accident we all know someone who was in a horrible car accident and if they survive they have years of rehab to go through victims of war or people with refugee status you know, if you imagine that for just practicing your religion, you could be killed in some countries. That's why people try to get out of these countries. It's not because they suddenly decide that this other country may be better. It's they cannot be who they are in the country of their origin. And it is a terrifying feeling. And also the sudden discovery or diagnosis of a major medical problem. Again, heart attack, cancer, multiple sclerosis. All of these things have a significant impact on our life and emotional well-being. So immediate crises demand immediate help. These clients need immediate help with you offering both a listening ear and routes toward action. Most people are resilient and recover after disaster despite their intense psychological 
and somatic initial reactions. Reminder, remember, clients have resilience and the capacity to deal with stress. Time can heal the wounds. It won't mean we'll forget them. It won't mean that we won't feel stress, but this idea of resiliency, you know, being able to bounce back, being able to come back from the edge of doom and restart your life. These are the characteristics that are uniquely human. The second type of crisis is a more quote unquote normal and typical part of life, but can also be extremely challenging. Many clients will pursue counseling for divorce or the breakup of a long term relationship, foreclosure of their home, job loss, income loss, a home break in and burglary, or the death of a loved one. Examples of the crises that children often experience include bullying, dealing with their own or parental illness, leaving friends and moving to a new location. For some, not getting into the desired college or failing an important exam can become a crisis situation. Again, you know, and we go back to what we learned about neuroses in human growth and development in that sense that, you know, some people put so much pressure on themselves that something that someone else would feel is just another drop of rain on a rainy day becomes a crisis for this person. Reminding clients of their strengths in the midst of a crisis may indeed produce resilience both now and in the future. People who are going through a crisis need to be reminded that they are strong, capable individuals who can manage whatever life throws at them. They just need help and a reminder that this is what needs to be done. A few more comprehensive ideas in terms of how we approach this as a team. So when a person with a gun approaches and attacks a school, college, bank, or after, you know, that team approach is going to help collectively. Um, you know, this year we're seeing, you know, this increase in school shootings and the teenagers who have experienced it in Parkland, Florida, have really become very um, outspoken in their beliefs. That is, in fact, helping each other manage and work through their crisis. So that kind of group mentality that team mentality can also help a group of people deal with that crisis. The aftermath of a bombing, fire, earthquake, or other disaster will typically need follow-up group and individual work. So, you know, group work is very helpful, but also, especially in these particular circumstances, there are individual experiences that need to be processed that may not be appropriate in a group environment. The message here is prepare for crisis. We never know when one will occur and what the crisis will, will be. While these techniques are for those first addressing clients who have just survived a major crisis such as a fire or flood, suggestions here also hold for those who seek counseling after the event. So during and after the event, the following techniques are going to be beneficial. First, we want to normalize trauma. So we don't want to call people who've experienced these things victims or survivors. Instead, people who have been in the middle of a disaster or who encountered a disaster. The latter term is more empowering for clients and puts them more in control. Thinking of people as victims tends to depersonalize them and put them in a helpless position controlled by external forces. Um, you know, you can go back to World War II when the Nazis imprisoned um, Jews and gypsies, po political prisoners. They didn't give them a name. They gave them a number that they tattooed on their arms. And the entire intent behind that was to depersonalize these folks, make them less than human. Another word that needs to be carefully used is the word disorder, which is an inappropriate term that ignores the client has responded in a normal fashion to an insane situation. If you're a kid whose high school got shot up 
and you feel out of control and overwhelmed, that's absolutely appropriate. Many crisis workers object the term post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, pointing out that virtually any serious encounter with crisis will produce extreme stress and challenges to the whole physical and mental system. So instead, we like to ter use the term severe stress reaction. Your clients have gone through a far from normal experience, helping clients see that their problem is not inside them, but the logical result of external stressors is one step towards normalizing the situation. All survivors of a crisis need to know that however they responded to severe challenges is okay and to be expected. So over there on the right is a uh, basically a, a very short table that tells you what happens to your body when you're under severe stress. And we know things like our blood pressure will go up. We, we know that our fight or flight instinct kicks in. That's with our nervous system releasing the norepinephrine. But you're also seeing different parts of the body, things like the liver, the pancreas, all of these things that are also getting in on the act. Your whole body is dealing with stress. Regardless of terminology, crisis and trauma are typically imprinted deeply in the brain and sooner or later may bring out sudden and unexpected fears, crying, or anger. Intrusive symptoms are unwanted and unwelcome by the individual who experiences them and can include repeated involuntarily distressing memories, dreams, flashbacks, and intense prolonged psychological and physiological reactions as if the traumatic event were still occurring. Other symptoms include sleeping difficulties and avoidance behavior which basically means you're detaching from friends or past activities. You're basically avoiding everyone and everything. These expressions may or may not be stimulated by the immediate situation. Crises can turn into severe stress reactions. Trauma at different stages in life will have different effects on brain development. So a traumatic event that occurs when you're seven or eight years old is going to have a different impact on your brain than a trauma that occurs when you're 40 or 50 years old. So you also have to take into account their age. Stress results in acute and chronic changes in neurochemical systems and specific brain regions, which result in long-term changes in brain circuits involved in the stress response. You're basically rewiring your stress response. Brain regions that play an important role in PTSD include the hippocampus, amygdala, and medial prefrontal cortex. Cortisol and norepinephrine are two neurochemical systems that are critical to the stress response. So when we are going through this trauma, we may feel this physical overwhelming sensation that in large part is coming, in fact, from our brain signing out, sending out all kinds of signals. A second major concept is providing some sense of calm and possibility in the situation. Again, normalizing the situation as a natural reaction. Don't say, calm down, it'll be okay, or you're lucky that you survived. Better calming language includes such comments as, it's safe now, if that's in fact true. We will see that this situation is taken care of. I feel bad myself and this was a terrible thing to go through. Your reaction and what you did are common and make sense. And the critical, what would help you right now? For those who are having flashbacks and this occurs with all types of trauma, calming and normalizing what they're experiencing remains the most important ideas. In particular, do not minimize the crisis. In some situations, you will think and even know that the client is overreacting. 
beware of our thoughts and feelings which may be valid but join the client where he ma he or she is enter the client's shoes as Carl Rogers might say and again this humanist perspective of put yourself in their shoes know what this is like they're not used to crisis they're not used to dealing with these things so consequently you know you as the counselor are the ones to guide them through it but you have to be empathetic assuring safety crisis and trauma survivors need to know that they are safe from the danger they have gone through offer verbal reassurance that the crisis is over and they are safe now again if they are indeed safe a woman who experiences spousal abuse or a homeless and hungry person needs to find a safe house or a place to stay and eat immediately and again this is where we go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs which is uh, the picture on the right safety forms one of the baselines if you don't feel safe you can't achieve anything so that's why it's so important to help people maintain that sense of safety stand up for what is right help clients find what they need connect them with resources and consider the statement with appropriate timing I'll be there with you to help next we want to look at a place at that we're gonna take action a good place to start is what do you need now for the counselor what can they do that is possible in the here and now and in the future the next step is to stay with clients and ensure that their needs are met so if somebody loses their house to a fire and the Red Cross takes them in we need to make sure that they have somewhere safe to stay. we need to make sure that they have some clothes to wear we need to make sure that they have something to eat we need to make sure that they have their medications so again going back to this Maslow's hierarchy of needs the most important aspects are these physiological and safety needs prepare them for what to expect after you have finished your conversation for example volunteers in the Haiti earthquake went to help with good intentions and indeed provided valuable assistance but soon they had to return home and often people were left up in the air with no knowledge of what to do next so a huge part of this is not just taking action but creating a long-term plan of action that picture by the way is a street in Haiti after the earthquake so it was pretty much demolished another aspect is called debriefing the story and this is when you talk to a family member or friend following a difficult and traumatic hospital situation have you noted that you often give the detail after detail and then the next time you see them tell them the same story perhaps even a third or fourth time we tend to repeat ourselves when we've been through trauma Freud called this wearing away the trauma people need to tell their stories and many must tell them again and again here the basic listening sequence becomes the treatment of choice if you paraphrase reflect emotions and summarize what they have said authentically and accurately they will know that someone has finally heard them and that's the important thing they don't feel heard they need to process what's happened to them so they're going to keep repeating themselves until they finally feel better and oftentimes talking about a problem over and over again will normalize that problem and minimize it in terms of your emotional reactions follow-up concrete action in the immediacy of a crisis is essential where possible the counselor wants to arrange to meet the client again for debriefing and planning in more detail for the future in some cases longer-term counseling and therapy will be needed watch for strengths and resilience if given sufficient early support most people work through their crises they have internal strengths that will carry them through look for these strengths and external resources that will enable them to recover at the same time even the most resilient survivor needs to debrief 
what has happened and again that's telling the story wearing the story as almost a badge where you tell it so many times it loses the power over you it becomes almost like a script so again positive psychology reminding them of their benefits their assets their personal strengths to help them get through this trauma the implications for the counselor is a very important aspect to this there is much more to a crisis counseling than what is said here but you will find that competence and expertise in the basic listening sequence and five-stage structure that will provide a map that will help carry you through some challenging situations all of us need to be ready to help in a crisis situation we may deal with immediate crises such as the ones we have focused on but we also need to understand the concepts underlying crisis counseling because so many clients will have experienced or are experiencing right now very difficult even impossible situations also think of the need for counselors to debrief what they have seen at the scene of an accident visualizing a dead child with a bloody mother stuck in a seat belt the father stunned and speechless EMTs and police and firefighters don't forget experiences like this it wears on them emotionally and frequently leads to depression there is a real need to provide counseling and support after such traumatic experiences there is also counselor and therapist trauma burnout counselors offer suffer burnout when they work with a major disaster for several days listen to endless safe stories on a crisis line or just do daily work and intervention as a mental health counselor counseling and therapy for the counselor needs to be considered as part of this support process so in other words it's important to also practice self-care you know one of the hardest things to do for many therapists and counselors is to practice the self-care because they've been trained to care for others and so looking at themselves and seeing their own emotional response to the stress they've been dealing with can oftentimes be difficult and as such it's also important to remember that the only person who will really take care of you is you so that self-care becomes radically important at this point each type of crisis is different adapt your approach accordingly establish trust and the working relationship as quickly as possible you will often have to act swiftly and sometimes decisively to help your clients reach the next stage beyond that first session community action is often the first thing before we move to individual counseling or coaching so you know if there's a um, earthquake or another natural disaster like a flood that occurs in your town you know maintaining the community becomes almost the most important part and then the individuals of that community become the focus so the community itself oftentimes is the first thing that needs help so we're going to move on now to suicide and we're going to talk about some of the issues associated with suicide suicide rates vary widely around the world and even by state and province with no clear patterns while US motor vehicle traffic deaths have declined over the past decade mortality rates for suicide are higher internationally we see the same trend death by suicide has increased by around 30 percent since 1999 so in 20 years it has tripled claiming nearly 45,000 lives in 2016 according to the report these trends apply to nearly every segment of the US population suicide rates have increased in 44 states among all racial and ethnic groups and in every age range except adults older than 75 in half of all states suicide rates increased by 30 percent or more so we're talking a significant number of people who are dying by their own hand and as counselors 
especially new ones, when we start things like banning suicide hotlines, this is what we're dealing with. Youth suicide is of particular concern. With suicide now the major cause, second major cause of death in the United States among the 15 to 24 age group. Only a year before it was the third leading cause, so that's rising. Meanwhile, the numbers in middle age are rising as well. So we're really seeing this increase in suicide uh, from the ages of 15 to 74. And that accounts for a large number of the population. Here is a, a few background issues that could lead a person to make a suicide attempt. These are the key factors to consider as indicating the possibility of a suicide attempt. So these are the things you want to look at. Severe anxiety, panic attacks, depression and the inability to experience pleasure, alcohol, especially alcohol abuse, difficulty in concentration, sleeplessness, hopelessness, employment problems, relationship loss, history of physical or sexual abuse, and a history of past deliberate self-harm or previous suicide attempts. So again what we're looking at here are some very serious issues that may exist in a person's background that you have to be able to identify. To this list we would add the dangers of drug abuse, serious health issues, and serious interpersonal conflicts such as bullying or harassment bad economic times such as the recent Great Recession in 2008 people were having a hard time finding work one couldn't pay their bills and at that point suicide also seemed to be really the way out of those problems another issue in the United States and I know this is controversial is the availability of guns but half the suicide deaths in the US occur using a gun while other routes may be typically be chosen in a physician assisted suicide guns are a quick easy way to do it men especially tend to use a gun whereas women tend to take an overdose or try poison um, or hang themselves men take that idea of going out with a bang so to speak there has been some research done that shows if there was a mandatory one week waiting period we could cut 10 20 30 percent of the suicides that occur in any given year so you know that's one of those issues that's not really discussed much in the gun control debate but um, for those of us who are in you know the therapeutic industry we know that if it was harder to get guns we would save more people the most central of these issues are maintaining a watchful eye for suicide potential, providing immediate crisis support, and ensuring a careful referral with follow-up to ensure that the client actually appears for their sessions. An excellent next step beyond this brief section is to download the Suicide Risk Assignment Guide and at this website. It's a government website so it's safe. I promise you won't uh, end up on a porn site. This is a sign that um, is put up next to the Golden Gate Bridge in California. Crisis counseling, there is hope, make the call. And then there's a little phone uh, box right next to the sign. The consequences of jumping from this bridge are fatal and tragic. They've even had to shut the bridge down because so many times people choose the Golden Gate Bridge to kill themselves. And it's, um, you know, go beyond tragic. It's a transportation hub that has become the suicide spot of choice for many people. The risk assessment guide suggests looking for strengths and resources to build on for both the here and now of the interview and the long-term safety of the client. So again, this personal, this positive psychology of finding the strengths to help vaccinate the client in terms of you know preventing suicide the guide points out the following which will be familiar to you from our emphasis on positive psychology and strength-based op approaches 
Use all of these as you seek to support your client while you plan for the appropriate referral. Positive social support, spirituality, a sense of responsibility to their family, children in the home or if they're pregnant, life satisfaction, reality testing ability, positive coping skills, positive problem solving skills, and a positive therapeutic relationship. The recommendation is to keep the counseling simple rather than theoretical and complex. Be with your client empathetically in the here and now. A lot of times people who want to kill themselves just don't feel heard and that again becomes something the counselor can do for the client. Behaviors that indica indicate suicidal thought have three key warning signs. An actual threat to hurt or kill oneself. Number two, seeking access to pills, guns, or other routes. Number three, talking or writing about death, dying, or suicide. And that also includes giving away valuable objects or pets to friends and family. In these cases, you need to take immediate action. The risk assessment guide reminds us to remove anything lethal and keep the client safe with some caring person available, even if that means taking them to a crisis center for a 72-hour suicide hold. Depending on the level of risk, get immediate help if necessary and facilitate moving to the hospital. The basic principles of crisis counseling remain. Your calmness, empathetic caring, and ability to listen are central, but you are also required to make decisions. As much as possible, share the decisions with the client. You know, I have a client. It is clear that they want to kill themselves. I explain that I cannot let them kill themselves, so I'm going to drive them to the crisis center. We're going to get them admitted. We're going to get them looked after. Because again, you know, yes, some people just truly want to die. They're in pain or they have some kind of terrible situation in their life and the only way out for them in their own minds is to kill themselves. But the vast majority of people who want to kill themselves can be stopped because they're overwhelmed with what's going on in their lives. They need to be reminded that there are people who love and care about them. Being direct is something that interviewers and counselors may have trouble with, but it is essential in this perspective. Be matter of fact, show concern, but not worry or shock. In this process, listening, non-judgmental warmth, respect, and caring will facilitate openness and trust. Show that you are present in the here and now and available with understanding and support. Focus the why question. This is not a time for focusing on rational explanations. The client may want to swear you to secrecy. This is not possible as it could lock out key safety procedures. Thus, be respectfully honest and open about the nature of the therapeutic relationship. You're there to help them save their lives. You're there to help them improve their lives. You're there to ensure their safety. Okay, so that's it for today. If you have any questions, please feel free to text or email your instructor. If you don't attend our college but do have a question, please leave a comment and we will get back to you as quickly as we can. Thank you and have a fabulous day.